Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you for joining us to commemorate our annual Holocaust Memorial Day in what is a very special year, 2021. Every year this event has a theme and this year's theme is Be the Light in the Darkness. And at such a difficult time for everyone because of the COVID pandemic, this seems more significant and poignant than ever. For Sutton Council, the Holocaust Memorial Day is a significant one in our yearly calendar, and we usually mark it by coming together with many different people from within our communities, including many school students, to pay our respects to those who lost their lives in such terrible events. Obviously, we can't meet up this year, but we felt it's important that the event should still go ahead, albeit a bit differently because we must remember, we must never forget the millions of lives that were lost during the Holocaust and then the subsequent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur. We'll be showing a film which highlights these terrible events which have taken place over the last few decades and the impact they've had on the lives of millions of people. As I said, the theme for this year's event is be the light in the darkness. And for me, with all that has happened over the last 12 months, this is such a powerful message. Over the past year, our lives have been turned upside down and many of us have witnessed dark days, not being able to spend time with the people we care about and in some cases, tragically losing them without being able to say goodbye properly. People have lost their jobs, their businesses, and all the activities that they relied on for physical and emotional support. Many of us have found ourselves struggling to come to terms with what's happened. But through this darkness, so much light has shone through. Here in Sutton, we've witnessed extraordinary kindness and compassion, and we're proud of the strength and solidarity of our local communities. We've seen so many large and small acts of kindness People reaching out to those who are struggling, who are lonely or isolated during these difficult times. I want to encourage everyone, whatever your age, to be shining lights and to give hope and love to all those who need it, not just now, but in the future as well. We can all stand together. We can all choose to be the light in the darkness for others who need our support. Thank you. And I'll now hand you over to the Mayor of the London Borough of Sutton, Councillor Trish Fivey. Thank you for joining us today to mark the Holocaust Memorial Day 2021. 2020 has certainly been an extremely difficult and challenging year for everyone. Today is a chance to remember the people who lived through the Holocaust, who somehow found a way to see some light through all the darkness, and also to remember there's always a reason for hope. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mrs Gill, a resident of the borough with the lived experience of the Holocaust. Mrs Gill was due to speak today, but unfortunately the pandemic and restrictions have prevented this. There is tremendous value in listening to the experience of others and empowering future generations with knowledge and understanding to ensure it never happens again. The theme for the Holocaust Memorial Day 2021 is Be the Light in the Darkness. I see this as a chance to both remember the depths to which humanity can sink, but also to remember the ways that people and communities will find a way to resist that darkness. How even in the darkest times, the light of humanity can still be found. As an example, I want to share with you the story of Edith Rubin. Edith was a Jewish girl who grew up in a small town in Hungary. However, in the late 1930s, things began to change. I had children that I played with, but one day they were told never to play with Jews. The Nazis forced her family to leave their home and to get on a train to the Auschwitz concentration camp. These were the camps where millions of Jews were to die. However, even amid the relentless cruelty of the Nazis, Edith recalled a few rare moments of kindness that in time helped her restore her faith in humanity. Edith remembers 
she and other prisoners were forced to march with heavy shovels to work. One day she was struggling to keep up, feeling weak because of a wound on her leg. That's when another prisoner, a young woman, stepped up to help her. I don't even remember her name, but maybe she felt sorry for me because it was hard for me to walk, she recalled. She took the shovel from me and said, I want to do it. And when I saw this kindness, then I imagined I had some hope. Edith believes this woman saved her life. If she'd been caught struggling or if she'd collapsed, the Nazis would have likely killed her. Secondly, she remembers the face of her young Danish rescuer. Edith, like many other prisoners, were covered in sores and lice because the guards would not let them change their clothes or wash. Despite this, the rescuer held Edith in his arms and asked her what she needed. After everything she had seen and gone through, she said, I could not believe it was possible. My heart was full of love. Despite the horrors of the Holocaust, many survivors found a way to see some light and to remind us that we need to do the same if we are to stop future genocides. Gina Turngill, MBE of the Survivors of the Holocaust, set us a task when she says, we will continue to do our bit for as long as we can, secure in the knowledge that others will continue to light a candle long after us. So how can you light a candle? We can see the truth as a kind of light. So if people try to deny the truth or scale of the Holocaust, we can shine a light on that truth through events like today. Some people want to persecute people because of their race, identity or beliefs. We can be a light by standing with those people as allies and demanding they are treated fairly and justly. We can allow darkness through our ignorance or we can be a light by continuing to learn about each other, to understand and accept different people and perspectives. We hear a lot about influencers in the news and on social media, but we are all influencers in our own ways. You don't have to change the world on your own, but together we can, if we can create light where once there was darkness. To summarise this, I want to quote from the Talmud. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obliged to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. Be the light. The 27th of January is Holocaust Memorial Day, the International Day of Remembrance for the victims and survivors of the Holocaust, Nazi persecution and subsequent genocides in Cambodia, Bosnia, Rwanda and Darfur. It gives us an opportunity to reflect on the consequences of discrimination and persecution and learn the lessons of the past. Between 1941 and 1945, the Nazis attempted to annihilate all of Europe's Jews. This systematic and planned genocide is known as the Holocaust. From the time they assumed power in 1933, the Nazis used propaganda, persecution and legislation to deny human and civil rights to Jews. Jews were denied citizenship, forbidden to marry non-Jews, to own businesses and to live in certain areas. The Nazis used centuries of anti-Semitism as their foundation. Nazi persecution extended beyond Jewish people, political opponents, the Roma and Sinti people, disabled people, gay people, Jehovah's Witnesses, Freemasons and black people were all targeted and hundreds of thousands of people were murdered. By the end of the Holocaust, six million Jewish people had been murdered in ghettos, mass shootings, concentration camps and extermination camps. I was 16 years old when we arrived in Auschwitz, Birkenau. Within a minute, I got separated from my mother and two sisters. A few minutes later, I got separated from my father. I had no opportunity to say goodbye to them. And from that day onwards, I never saw them again. After Auschwitz, Eugene was imprisoned at the Buchenwald concentration camp. 
He was forced to work in the tunnels at the Dora Mittelbau labor camp and was finally imprisoned in the concentration camp at Bergen-Belsen. The scenes in Bergen-Belsen were terrible. There were dead bodies lying all over. The place was infected by typhus. I personally came down to five stone. For 50 years, Eugene said nothing of his ordeals, but now he speaks regularly about the atrocities that he experienced in his youth. In doing so, he has joined a group of survivors who work extremely hard to make sure that the Holocaust will never be forgotten. I've been speaking to universities, colleges, schools for 65 years, ever since I came over to this country in 1946. I've made numerous films about the Holocaust, particularly about Auschwitz, about uh, my time on the Death March, and I have even taken some neo-Nazis back to the camp. It is very important that people understand what happened and learn something from what happened in the past, because we have no guarantee today that it cannot happen again. We believe it can happen to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Sadly, in the years that have passed since the end of the Holocaust, the world has seen genocide take place again and again. In the 1970s, the Khmer Rouge systematically evicted the population of Cambodia from its towns and cities and forced everyone to work on huge collective farms. Anyone who refused or moved too slowly was killed. For three years, eight months and 20 days, we were forced to labor, to work in the rice field from sunrise to sunset with only two bowls of rice soup a day. Jenny, my daughter, was nine when she died and she died of starvation because I had not enough rice to give her to her. To look at your daughter slowly dying of starvation this is really hard for a mother, and I will never forget this. In Cambodia, the number of people murdered reached two million. In Rwanda, using little more than clubs and machetes, members of the Hutu people massacred almost a million men, women, children and babies who belonged to either the Tutsi people or moderate Hutus. It was 10 o'clock in the morning when the Mauritius come to attack in the, our house and um, I managed to escape just jumping through the window but my family could make it. I climbed the tree which was in the backyard. I could hear the, the sound of crying and mourning inside the house. But unfortunately, a few minutes later, those sound has stopped. That's when I knew everybody was dead. In former Yugoslavia, the Serbs targeted Bosnia in their wish for political domination. They were prepared to achieve this by isolating and even exterminating ethnic groups. I was taken away together with my brother and the rest of the villagers, and I ended up in the Omarska concentration camp. During my stay in the Omarska camp, uh, I was treated worse than a rat. My life was worth less than life of a rat. The worst aspect of being kept in the Omarska camp was the fact that the place was guarded by my former schoolmates, former neighbors, former policemen who, whose protection I relied before the war, and even former teachers but lessons remain unlearned. Genocide is still taking place today. Right now, in the Darfur region of Sudan, against a backdrop of civil war and with the backing of the Sudanese government, members of the Arab population are currently persecuting black African farmers who they see as inferior people. To date, millions of people have been displaced and hundreds of thousands of men, women and children have been murdered in Darfur. On Holocaust Memorial Day, 
we have a chance to think about what we can do to put an end to persecution and discrimination. My hope for the Holocaust Memorial Day is for the people to learn about the genocide so that it won't happen again. The more people commemorate the Holocaust on Holocaust Memorial Day, the more awareness there will be of the dangers and the more people will learn. I hope that the Holocaust Memorial Day can inspire people, especially young people, to understand that you know, they, they can make a difference, that one person can make a difference. I want to ask young people, as they are the decision makers of the future, to learn the lessons of the past so that these crimes will never happen again. My dearest wish and hope is for us to live in harmony, to respect each other and learn to live and let live. We all have the opportunity to use Holocaust Memorial Day to learn the lessons of the past to create a safer, better future. Auschwitz, the Nazi death camp where more than a million people, mainly Jews, were murdered. People with families and friends. Ordinary people robbed of their future. Each had their own unique story of how they came to be at Auschwitz. Only a minority survived. And today, decades later, very few can explain what happened there as witness to its human terror. Kitty Hart Marxen was 17 years old when she arrived at Auschwitz-Birkenau in April 1943. Now she travels back one last time to answer the questions of a new generation. My name is Kitty Hart Moxen, and I'm a Holocaust survivor. Designed as a factory of death, no one was intended to survive, let alone describe its inhumanity to a world not yet ready to listen. No one wanted to know, no one wanted to hear what I had to say. But I made a commitment that uh, the people don't want to hear, but I'm going to make sure that they will. I've been here many times, but I really wanted to come with two girls who were my age when I was here. I want to show them the struggle for survival. What were your first impressions of the camp? There was just the most incredible mud. And then we saw a, like a glow in the distance. And soon when we got there, we saw ghost-like figures with shaved heads staggering in tattered clothes with great big eyes screaming in all languages and being beaten and we thought my god is this was going to happen to us i've known kitty since i was born i've known about her story since i was little and sort of grown up with the influence of it what did you first see when you got off the train alsatian dogs they were barking trying to get at us and i wanted to try and understand a bit better how she coped in these conditions and how she managed to survive for so long. And we're walking into the women's camp now. I met Kitty for the first time after the school talk she gave us and I went up and asked some questions to her. And I'm just kind of nervous and excited because I want to see it from a different perspective that I may have seen it in class. And you see these stumps? These are the chimneys of the wooden barracks. What happens to you? when you were in those formative years, aged 13 to 16, it shapes you and your character for the whole of your life. Auschwitz is where my grandma feels she belongs and it always calls her back. Kitty Hart was one of the first survivors to tell her story. She gives us access to that experience with the power of her words. You have to treat what Kitty says almost like music I hear what she says, and I also try to listen to what 
she has left unsaid. You see this crossroad? The crossroad was the crossroad to life or death. The very fact that Kitty was an eyewitness and can say, this is what I saw, actually ensures that it cannot be denied, that the intentionality of the perpetrators is clear, and that it's indisputable that what she saw is what happened. And as you walked, you got stuck in this mud and all these people were falling around in the mud. You cannot stand there and simply say, this is okay. This should never have happened. It should never have existed. And as a human being, thinking about the experience of others, you just realize this is no place for anybody to have ever been. Just prior to invasion, my father decided we've got to get out. My brother fled with his friends to the Russian side. They were asked to join the army, the Polish army, within a Russian unit, and eventually was killed in the Battle of Stalingrad. So my father, my mother, and my grandmother, we got on the last train. The train just took us to Lublin, and that's where everyone was thrown out, and that's where we landed up. And we were taken to a part of the town which became the Lublin ghetto. It wasn't possible to survive in Poland as a Jewish person without relying on somebody else. So Katie's mother, in a time of crisis, what does she do? She starts teaching English to people. In doing that, she creates a relationship with the priest. The priest told my mother, if you come to a point where there's no way out, just come and I'll see what I can do. The priest then is able to help and puts his life on the line to provide them documents to get them out. We had to part from my father. The priest said, no way could we survive all three of us together. My father was to go and work in this sawmill somewhere we didn't know where. And my mother and I, we were to go into the center of Lublin. Why? Because they were rounding up the Polish population as well. And when they sorted them out, they took them to work in factories in Germany. And the priest said, that's what we've got to do. We've got to get out of the country and mix with this transport and get into Germany. And they actually checked documents, but our documents were in order, you see. And before my mother and I collected our thoughts, we were in a train and landed up far, far inside Germany. It was very difficult for Jews to be able to hide within the Polish population because just small cultural and linguistic things such as accents would, could creep in and change the perception of you as being truly a Polish citizen. Well, what happened was because uh, they suspected us, uh, one of them reported us to, to, uh, to the authorities and that was our downfall. Kitty was arrested for illegal entry into Germany as Leokadia Dobzhinska and sent for interrogation. The Nazis wanted to know the source of their false documents. The irony of the Nazis was they could create death camps and murder Jews with impunity, but if somebody broke a law, they had to go through the penal system, which was complete nonsense because they could have simply deported them to Auschwitz as Jews. But because the legal system didn't allow it, they eventually were deported to Auschwitz um, with a death penalty for immigration charges. So we were told we were going to be executed by firing squad. Oh, it was a brick wall, and we had to face the wall with our arms up like that, standing facing the wall. And then there was a huge explosion. And I thought, God, I'm, I haven't been hit. There was a great laughter. They said, oh no, we're not going to kill you. What's going to happen? We're going to commute your death sentence to life imprisonment in Auschwitz, and we're going to hand you over to the camp. They'll find out where, where these documents came from. So we were in a train that was specially converted to transport prisoners. And we traveled 48 hours standing before we arrived in Auschwitz. Well, we had absolutely no idea where we were. It was dark. What did you first see when you got off the train? Well, the thing opened up and oh, you heard an awful lot of noise. Were you scared? 
Well, we were scared of the dogs yeah. and, and then the great big women with whips and they were whipping everyone and urging everyone to run, 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 everything at a running pace. Suddenly, there was a weird kind of stench and the closer we got, the worse the stench became. Uh, and my mother, my mother said, what a curious place there. Can, can you smell? Can you smell roasting meat? I said, yes, I can. She said, do you think they're roasting chickens here at this time of the night? I said, I don't know. Kitty and her mother were sent to Birkenau, the largest of the 44 camps in the Auschwitz system, where they were processed and sent to quarantine. When did you first stay in a wooden barrack? Well, this was the quarantine, okay? So the first night, we were pushed into here. Did you find somewhere to sleep? Well, we, we squeezed in somewhere here. I was incredibly cold that night because we were 48 hours without food and, and I slept all night next to a woman. Mm. And she started speaking to me in German. It turned out she was a German gypsy. Mm. Right. During the early morning, while she was talking to me, she looked at my hand. She took my hand, she said, give me your hand. And she said, you know, you're going to come out. And the next thing that happened, whistles blew suddenly, it was still dark, and, and everybody would say, rouse, rouse, out. And of course, this was quarantine, we didn't know. Yeah. And I shook this woman, you know? Yeah. And she didn't move. And I said to my mother, she's cold, she's dead. And I said, you know, you're cold, I'm cold. We need to strip her and we need to have everything she's got. Yeah. Surviving Auschwitz was virtually impossible. And there was certainly no way you can say, if you did this, then this would happen. It was a matter of luck and chance and being in the right place at the right time. But there were some circumstances and some strategies that kind of worked. That came to me that night, that actually that's the way to do it. That if you do have the people that had died, you've yeah. got to take everything off them. Because it was not good to them, was it? You had to do what you needed to do to survive, and if that was taken from the dead, that's what it meant. Not in the history of mankind has there been industrial killing on this scale. If something happened once, there's absolutely no reason why it can't happen again. In 1943, Kitty was assigned to work on a new rail line into Birkenau called The Ramp. In 1944, she watched as transports of Jews from Hungary started to arrive. What was the importance of The Ramp? People arrived in cattle trucks and sometimes seven or ten trains would arrive in, in say, in 24 hours and people were sealed in, almost airtight, just a little bit of air coming through the slats. Sometimes the trains were sealed here for hours before they were allowed to unload. Did people die in the trains? Yeah, a lot of people died before they arrived here. Some people travelled seven days before they arrived here. Did anyone have any idea what was happening when they got off the train? People had not the foggiest idea what was going to happen. Of course, there were people coming from the ghettos, mm. so they didn't expect anything, you know, good, obviously. Everything was very nice and quiet because they didn't want people to panic. So loudspeakers were here telling people, well, there's a lot of typhus here, and so you're all going to be disinfected, and we've got to split. We went from women and women with children. Leave your luggage, leave your luggage, you're going to get your luggage later. And then someone came right, left, men this way, women this way, women with children on one side, younger people are younger, you can go that way. Oh, you're older, you, you take your child with you, it'll be fine. You mm. take your child, we're not going to split you up. It was shocking to see that you stood in the exact same place as those people did once. At the ramp, women with children and the elderly were sent directly to their death. And if you were young and able-bodied, and if at that period of time they needed workers, then you were chosen for slave labor, which essentially meant that um, you were chosen to die slowly, not to die immediately in the gas chambers. Let me tell you, at this point, Families were split, never ever saw one another again. So, some of the men were taken this way, mm. okay. 
some of the girls that were selected to go into the camp were taken through there. You were just told to go that way. And you know the road there. Where does that go? The gas chambers. That's it. Hi, my name is Reverend Shmully Aronson. I am the Minister of Sutton and District, United Synagogue. I want to firstly thank all the organisers of this tremendous and important Holocaust Memorial Day event. And I also want to thank each and every one of you for participating in this event. In Jewish teaching, history plays a massive role. We remember where we've come from. We remind ourselves what we've been through, both the good and the less so. Remind ourselves of the people that had an influence along the way. But here's the thing. The point of remembering these details is not for the sake of the past, but rather for the sake of our present, for the sake of our future. What I mean is this. We can look at the past. We can see what others have done wrong. We can see what we've, we've done wrong ourselves. But more importantly, we can look at those and then look forward and see what we can do right. In my mind, this is not just an event to remember the terrible atrocities of our shared history, but more importantly, to remind ourselves of our collective responsibility for our present and shared future. This Holocaust Memorial Day, I remind myself of the darkness that too many suffered through, including my own grandparents, my extended family. But not just for the sake of understanding where evil can lead us to. Rather, I, that I can remind myself to be a bearer of light for the present and future. You see, today, unfortunately, there are still too many that are suffering. Too many people live in darkness both personal and societal. Be it social injustice, racism, physical and mental health, and unfortunately so, so much more. I therefore remind myself today, and I encourage you to do so too, to be a light in this darkness. You see, for all it takes is just a little bit of light to dispel so much darkness. I'm about to recite the traditional memorial prayer in loving memory of those that tragically lost their lives during the Holocaust and its subsequent genocides. Let's remember these precious individuals by letting them know that despite the darkness they die through, their lights shine on because we take it upon ourselves today to better our present world and the future by lighting up the darkness for those around us. This will be followed by a minute of silence and reflection. And if you're able to, please do stand. In Mahira Hami, Mishikhe, Imam Ruimi, Hamaseh, Minukhunakhina, Kamfi Ashakin, Ho, Pimalo, Istoishi, Motel, Irim. Kizoya Horakiya Mirim Mazirim Es Nishmois Achin Vahyusenu River Voice River Voice Bene Yisroel Anoshim Noshim Vetav Shinehol Shehenishatu Shinis Refu Shinech Neko Shinit Vishnik Burhaim Vishumaho so homing me says Mishun noise. We day Hanatim Voyreem, you march mom. Umosaru as Nashom Alkadusha Sashem Mavo. Shall not miss Falim Lelunish me say. 
לוחם על הרחמים, יסירי מסיר כנוף ובלי אורוי לומים, וישרוי וישרוי החיים עץ נשמי סיים. בגן עדן תהי מנוחוסו, אדוני הוא נחלו עושום, וינוחו בשלום עם עמיש כבויסום, ונאמר, and let us say, Amen. Loving God, we come to you with heavy hearts, remembering the six million Jewish souls murdered during the Holocaust. In the horrors of that history, where so many groups were targeted because of their identity, and in genocide which followed, we recognize destructive prejudices that derive people apart. Forgive us when we give space to fear, negativity and hatred of others, simply because they are different from us. In the light of God, we see everyone as equal, precious manifestation of the divine and can know the courage to face the darkness. Through our prayers and actions, help us to stand together with those that are suffering, so that the light may banish all darkness, love will prevail over hate, and good will triumph over evil. And let us say, Amen. Thank you. I'm sure, like me, you will have found those films upsetting, but also very powerful. I'd like to thank the many people who have come together and worked so hard to make this event possible. Thank you to the Mayor of Sutton, Councillor Trish Fivey, for sharing her words with us, and also for mentioning Mrs Eve Gill, who is always such an inspiring speaker at our event. We're in touch with Mrs Gill and we hope to see her here next year. Thank you to the Reverend Aronson for his prayer and for sharing his story. Thank you to Sutton Council colleagues who have made today's video possible and it's great to know that this video will be shared after today. But finally, thank you to all of you for taking the time to join us, to watch and listen. Because we must never forget these terrible events of our past. And we all need to think about how, in our own way, we can always be the light in the darkness. Thank you.